Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And this part of the lecture, as promised, I was going to revisit the Andrew Wake, Wakefield MMR and autism study, or for that matter, studies. Okay. Again, this is to showcase what we call pseudoscience, bias science, um, and just in general, not following the scientific method. You guys are going to practice this. We're going to have some assignments where, you know, I will give you examples of science. You'll go through and you'll need to tell me whether or not the individuals are following the scientific method and conducting uh, sound science or if there's a bias or potential bias. Okay, And in some cases it, it can be difficult to see the bias that is created by an individual. For example in the Andrew Wakefield case okay, it took a while for the scientific community to completely dismiss Andrew Wakefield's findings and his co-author's findings. So let's go through kind of what this looks like. Okay, Wakefield et al. Et al. For those of you who are not familiar with it, just means and others. Okay, so you can see up here there are a bunch of authors. Okay, that's not all of them. Okay, there are 12 authors on this publication. It was published in February of 1998. Okay, you can see big red letters that says it's retracted. We'll get to that in a little bit. I already kind of discussed it before that it was retracted early on, um, and and that's semi-true. You'll see you'll see what I mean by that. Okay, but Wakefield's publication was investigating the link between MMR, okay, autism and intestinal issues or um, you know the leaching of proteins into the intestine which might then affect uh, the neurology of an individual leading to autism okay and so that's kind of the nutshell of the paper if you want to read the paper you can um, clearly read the paper it's still out there you just have to you know, read underneath the retracted sign, but the Lancet still has it up there for people to read. So the publication, this is where I say it was difficult at times for the scientific community to dismiss all the findings in Wakefield's paper because the Wakefield paper or the authors of, of this paper were very careful in their wording on the link between MMR and autism. In fact, they say we do not prove an association between measles, mumps, and rebellion vaccine and the syndrome described. That would be autism. Okay. Now, as as new upcoming scientists, you would know that it doesn't matter if you prove it or not, because in in biological sciences, which is you know studying vaccinations and viruses and things like that they're not proving anything anyways we don't prove things in science we only support it that's where the rest of the paper kind of comes into play there are lots of correlations that are drawn via the authors that are attempting to correlate vaccination especially this triple vaccination measles mumps and rebellion with autism Okay. Standing alone, the paper would be probably just fine. No one actually would even have had an issue with the paper except for um, the methodology of the paper was extremely flawed. But the outcome of the paper, the discussion of the paper probably wouldn't have raised too many eyes until Andrew Wakefield himself started doing press conferences right as the publication comes out he wanted the word out to all you know as many people as possible so you know he's doing interviews and things like that and in his interviews he's openly withdrawing 
from the support of what he claims are triple jab vaccines, or in other words, this triple vaccine of measles, mumps, and rebellion. In fact, in many of his conversations, many of his interviews, he states that MMR vaccines do cause autism. Okay? So by doing this, even though it's not in the paper directly, although the correlations are definitely there, um, he is stating that he believes as the lead author that MMRs are causing autism and other intestinal uh, disorders and things like that. Okay. So by doing that, it really drew a lot of attention from other scientists. Whoa, this guy's talking about this. So they wanted to read his paper. So they did. And it didn't take long. Lee et al. in 1998 in March, so literally one month later, had already wrote a letter to The Lancet. Okay, so the same journal that Wakefield published in saying, hey, look, there's some huge issues with this publication. It should have never been published. And here are some of the issues. First of all, the experimental flaws. Okay, sample size. There's only 12 individuals and all of them are autistic. Okay, so therefore there is no control. There's no children that are not autistic. Okay, so they weren't checking for these intestinal disorders on children that don't have autism. Okay, so is this MMR causing intestinal disorders in normal children? Okay, or non-autistic children? Okay, there is missing data, massive amounts of missing data. Only five of the 12 cases that Wakefield et al. used had any information about when the autistic behavior started. So even though the correlation is that's put forth by Wakefield is that after these children were getting shots, the triple vaccine, literally days later, okay, within a 14 day period, they're showing autistic behaviors. Okay? That's the comment in the paper, that's the claim, that that's the correlation. Okay? However, only five of the cases have information with when the autistic behavior started. There's no blind investigator. Okay? Wakefield knew every single one of these children, every single one of them had autism. He, he knew everything about them. Okay? He didn't have anyone from outside you know, his circle uh, examine the data. He didn't have anyone outside of his circle no, uh, you know, have any less prior knowledge to the study. So the study had massive amounts of flaws. Okay? And so Lee et al. really wanted to draw attention to these flaws. Okay? And in doing so, it started investigations. Okay? So literally one month after the publication, it was already on, Lan on the Lancet's dock or in their opinion that they're already in the process of retracting the paper. So the problem with retraction of papers, at least prior to this um, debacle, you could say, the problem with it is it takes a very long time. Okay? It takes lots of different scientists, more, it has to go through another review period. You have to have other studies that try to mimic this study that have been published and show that, again, they could not reproduce the study. So it takes a long time, but that initial letter starts the entire investigation and the entire period of um, removal of the paper, removal of the science, okay? So the investigation, this is what, um, came up out of the investigation, some of it prior um, to the uh, partial removal of the paper or partial retraction of the paper. We'll talk about that in a second, okay? Some of it after, during a lawsuit that was brought up against Wakefield himself 
himself and a couple of his co-authors for malpractice. Okay, But it came out that Wakefield was a paid expert for lawyers that were suing over vaccine injuries. Okay? So Wakefield was already being paid prior to this study by lawyers to be an expert in these families that were suing because they felt that this vaccine was causing harm to their children. Right? He did not provide that information. He did not enclose that information to the Lancet, which is a massive violation of scientific process. You have to give information that shows that you already have connections to either your your experimental or experimentees you have connections to a funding source you have a connection to you know a uh, maybe a chemical provider you know these things have to be hashed out prior to publication so people can see what your biases are it was never paid it was never allowed for the Lancet to know this. Okay. In fact, some conflicts of interest, huge conflicts of interest, a few of the children that were in the study, now mind you, there was only 12 individuals, and we already talked about sample size. Sample size, your samples aren't, your study isn't very good if it's less than 30. Okay. Let's just put it that way. It's, it's hard to draw very many statistical inferences when you have less than 30 samples, okay? On top of that, a few of the children that were used in the study or part of the study, and I say used because some of these children were, um, in my opinion, used as a ploy to get rid of this vaccination and to tie this vaccination to autism. Okay, and you'll see why I, I feel that way as we progress. Okay, so a few of the children were part of the lawsuits. Okay, so remember, he's being paid by lawyers for families that are suing on vaccination. And some of those families' children, he chose to be study of the law, study to be part of the study that he published. Okay, huge conflict of interest. You already know where those families stand. You already know the self-reporting that those families are going to say. They've already stated because of a lawsuit that MMR is causing autism in their children. It's already been stated. Okay? That's what the lawsuit's about. Okay, One of the big ones and one that actually ended his career okay, as, a, as a doctor in in the United Kingdom was that Wakefield was a gastroenterologist, okay? but he was doing spinal taps on children without any approval of the ethics board and without the relevant qualifications. Okay? So there are ethic, ethics boards that are put in place to stop individuals from doing things that are either deemed unethical or that are deemed outside of their expertise. Okay? And so he's collecting these spinal taps himself without the qualifications, without the ethical support or approval from the ethics board. Okay? It's a huge, huge issue. And it wasn't until this investigation came out that people started to dive in and look at Andrew Wakefield's background. Apart from that, he was paying children at his son's birthday party to donate blood. Now, this is according to his co-authors. A couple of his co-authors said that he was paying children at his son's birthday party to donate blood. He says that his son, at his son's birthday party, children were donating blood, and he and, you know, and he lies about, well, he says he was lying about certain situations where children were passing out at his son's birthday party and, you know, vomiting at his son's birthday party. And then he goes on to say that, you know, people asked him, well, is this a problem? And he said, well, they're getting paid. So next time 
instead of five euros, maybe they'll want 10, okay? He says it was a joke that he told people in public, but then he said that he lied about the outcomes, like this, the individuals passing out and vomiting, okay? But he didn't retract that he paid individuals, children, to donate blood, okay? This is another major issue, okay? Um, clearly, paying children to donate blood is against ethic boards, and it's against scientific methodology. Okay. Apart from that, okay, there was a period, so starting in 1998, once Lee published his paper, then people started going out and they're starting trying to re redo Wakefield study, okay, the 1998 Wakefield study. Okay, they're trying to replicate it. No one could replicate it. No one could get the same data. I mean, it was impossible to get the same findings. Okay, not a single study has ever replicated it. Okay? And so because there's it's non-replicable, okay, then you know that drew to even more criticism of the study. And then finally, Wakefield himself, because he was under a lot of scrutiny from the scientific community, he tried to do a follow-up study. And his follow-up study used PCR, which is a way to amplify DNA strands. Okay? And so he used some genetic evidence, or tried to use some genetic evidence, to um, get at another avenue, another experimental avenue of connecting MMRs to autism. Okay? But the problem is, is the lab or the individuals that Wakefield used to do the PCR, it was a massive flaw. Okay? It was a, a huge, even, you know, even more so in their experiment, it was a huge flaw with their experiment because they didn't know what they were doing. So experts like Stephen Buston came in, he's a PCR expert, came in and he, he looked at their their material, he looked at the study and he's like, hey, look, these are all false positives, okay? You had plasmids that were already testing positive or derived from positive plasmids and you contaminated the entire laboratory okay, by using that. And so it comes out that not only was the 1998 paper flawed, the 1999 paper was flawed, Okay, which basically leads to the end of bad study or actually the end of bad science in general. In 2004, the Lancet Journal did a partial retraction. Okay? So what this means is the investigation is still ongoing, but they're partially retracting the 1998 paper. So it took a while, but you can expect for it to take a while given that you had to have all these other studies also fail to replicate the Wakefield study. Okay? So it's not super fast, but the process starts with that initial letter of review. Hey, look, we don't like your science. We think you have a massively flawed system. We want the Lancet to start investigating this study. Okay? So they did partial. In 2010, the Lancet did a full retraction of the article. Along with that, Neurotoxology Journal withdrew the paper by Wakefield, which was on chimpanzees. They removed it. They wouldn't even review it. So they stopped the review process and said, nope, we're not going to publish it. The American Journal of Gastroenterology, they retracted a paper that Wakefield published um, that used data from the 12 children that he public that he had data on in 1998 so they retracted that journal apart from that the the general medical council stripped wakefield of his medical license and the right to practice in the united kingdom okay so 
yes, it took a while, okay, all the way till 2010 before the issue was completely done. And it's still, it's still not done because there's still individuals that believe the pseudoscience that Wakefield was producing, even though there's so many reports and ev evidence that suggests that the science was bad science. It was a poorly designed experiment, and there was massive biases going into the experiment. So we can ask, and I want you to ask, did the Lancet Journal, did, did they make the mistake? Okay. Did they have peer reviewers that were just so busy that they just glanced over it and, and they didn't pick up what Lee et al. picked up in the fact that the scientific method wasn't followed and the fact that there was no control, there was huge biases, that there was no blind investigators, that, you know, that there was big problems with this study. Well, yes, they did make a mistake. In fact, the Lancet Journal has come out numerous times saying that we've learned from our mistakes. The publication from Wakefield should have never been published. Okay. And to show you that, check this out. The Lancet retracts a hydroxychloroquine study. Okay. And so you might have heard of hydroxychloroquine, okay? Uh, it's been, you know, toted as this miracle drug for uh, anti-COVID or to remove COVID symptoms, okay? Even the president, Donald Trump, um, has said that, you know, hydroxychloroquine is this miracle drug, you should be taking it, et cetera. Well, researchers started examining that, okay? And they started looking at this drug and whether or not this drug that's normally used for malaria or anti-malaria, so you don't get malaria, whether it was, would be, you know, useful in COVID. And in fact, that they, they came out with a study that said, not only is it not useful in COVID, but it also increases the rate or increases the possibility of death in patients. But here's the kicker with it all. That was published, but then individuals said, okay, well, we want to see the data, the raw numbers. And because the researchers cannot provide the raw numbers, because they got the information, they got the data from a third party kind of data collection system that in that data collection system, it says they will not share the raw data. So they won't share the age, name, you know, these kind of things, uh, maybe previous uh, medical history with anyone. The researchers knew this going into the study. They knew that this data collection system would not give them the complete raw data to for anyone to see. And so the Lancet retracted the paper. They said, look, if you can't provide all the data that's requested, and it was a huge study. There was literally thousands of, you know, samples, thousands of experimentees that the data was collected on. But if you can't provide the raw data for that, then we got to pull your paper. Okay? And so the Lancet is becoming a journal that's now learn from its mistakes. It learned from its mistake that, hey, look, we're not just going to publish a paper and then when someone calls us out, it's going to take 12 years to do a full retraction. Okay, This took literally one month to do a full retraction because the data was not provided to the individuals that wanted to see it. Okay. So we're going to practice scientific method. And we're going to practice trying to pick out whether or not a study 
is doing good science, bias science, or whether it's pseudoscience. Next time.